my name is Yusun Kim, and um, currently I'm, a, I'm leading the mobile analytics in Salesforce. I'm a designer, lead designer there, and then Steve Barron, I don't need to explain, and then introduce him. He, he runs the full day workshop, first day, and um, this morning he did a keynote. So, yeah. So, before I dive into the mobile analytics, I want to give you guys a brief background of each of us. Um, me, myself, I'm Yusin Kim. As you guys can see, I'm originally from Seoul, Korea. So um, I have a pretty strong background in art and design. I drew a lot, painted a lot, and then that naturally led me to um, go to graphic design school in Seoul, Korea, where I learned a lot of traditional um, graphic designs like typography, book binding, and posters, brochures, and I was super in interested, in, interested in traditional media at that time, and um, collaborated with a lot of artists, and also um, beautiful experiences. And I was more and more interested in um, new technologies, digital media, like human interaction designs and computer, physical computing. And I, so I applied a lot of schools in the state, and um, I went I got an offer from the school in California. That's where I learned a lot of new technologies, like how humans behave, why they, they are behaving like the way they are doing. And um, there, I had the opportunity to work, work in the industries. I gained a lot of industry experience too, like product buildings. I did a lot of animations. Um, I worked on Iron Man too. There's a lot of like a graphic, so natural. If you adventure. watch, if you watch Iron Man, the movie, you know the user interface that you see, Tony Stark interface. He yeah, helped design it, that. Yeah, it was, I was really fortunate. He's to very humble. Give him a huge round of applause. He's amazing. Yeah, and, so, and also Dragon Ball, Valkyrie, and then after that, um, I was leading search experience at Yahoo, mobile and tablet, and then fortunate enough to work with Steve now in the Salesforce as a lead designer in the mobile analytics. So that's, that's uh, my journey. And I'll give you a short journey. I encouraged Yusung to give his full journey because I know there are probably a lot of people here who will gain a lot by talking to somebody like Yusung, and you can then not have to talk to me. So uh, everybody probably, if you didn't see the keynote or the workshop, you might remember me from the last two UX Indias. My name's Steve Fadden. I'm an engineering psychologist. Uh, my background, that's my background, and I'm a UX research director at Salesforce, and I also teach at UC Berkeley. And my voice is going to crack a lot because I'm not used to talking this much. Yeah, Steve is talking last three days, like really <laughs> four times, four days. So, um, yeah, we want to share our brief journey, like where we are, how we get to our position, because uh, we, we got a lot of questions, like a couple of days, like what, what should be the next step? for my career as a practitioner, UX practitioner. So our, the way we arrived here is like one of the journey, so definitely. So um, yeah, let's dive into the mobile analytics. Who are we designing for? Target audiences. Um, I want to start with the challenges we had when we just um, thinking about mobile analytics. It was almost like now three, four years ago? Four right? years ago. Yeah, four years ago. At that time, there was a I would say there's no mobile analytics. Like people never thought about they would uh, see the dashboard and report on the mobile phone factor. So it, there was definitely a huge challenges. First, um, there were some existing uh, products, but they were all comparative. Like, like and use cases is the desktop. There was none of the use cases for mobile. So we really wanted to understand how users would, um, what would be the most strong use cases, robust use cases on the mobile phone factor. So we talked to a lot of people, and then the, uh, we arrived, users would consume most of their data on the phone factor instead of creating dashboards or doing like heavy test, test down work. So our target audience is, is definitely sales and service executives. They are the one always on the go meeting a lot of people. So they want to, but while they are, uh, outside of the office, they always want to check like um, what's the business going right now, how it's performing, what 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 his teams um, looks like. All those big numbers, they want to check on the mobile mobile phone factor. 
consuming data. And um, service executives, are, our customers are happy. How is the chipset like? That was the big number they really want to see on the mobile phone factor. And also, individual contributors, sales, sales reps, they are really, every quarter, every week, they always check their quota. Am I going to meet this time or not? How am I performing compared to their peers? That's the key, key numbers they want to see on the mobile. And also sales or service use case would be like field service. They are always on the go different customers. So they want to see the addresses, their time frame, and am I doing the, am I um, providing the right solutions for them? So these are the two main uh, target audiences. And see if we want to talk about Yeah, so the focus of this talk isn't on research, but I did want to talk about some of the research challenges we had reaching out to audiences like this. As you can imagine, having people like executives, so chief sales officer, chief financial officer, um, chief executive officers are very difficult to recruit. And so one of the challenges that we had was A, getting budget. Luckily, we were, we're Salesforce, so we can get a budget. But then B, how do you get these really, really selective, difficult users um, to actually participate in a study, whether it is an observational study, an interview, a usability test. So part of the challenge we had was a very high no-show rate, over 50%. So think about this from the perspective of a designer waiting to see validation on your design, or a researcher waiting to engage in an activity, and you've got eight people lined up, and three or four of them actually show up. It makes sense from the context of sales, right? Am I going to show up to this study that maybe pays me $50 US, or am I going to land this deal that might win me $400,000 US, right? So we understood the challenges, but we had to over-recruit for all of our studies and all of our, um, our tests. Another challenge we had is region. Um, as you probably know, Salesforce is headquartered in San Francisco. There's a problem and a benefit. The benefit is it's very easy to find mobile users in San Francisco. It's kind of where um, Apple and mobile devices were born. The bad news is that user is not representative of most people around the world. And so if we were going to do in-person work, we would have to keep in mind that the bar is being set really high in terms of the mobile user expectations. And we have to do a lot to reduce our bias from generalizing too much from this very sophisticated group of users. Um, and the third, I have to cheat because I have too many talks. The third was actually seeing the activities. So even if you're doing something in person with, a, with an end user of mobile, it's very difficult to monitor and record their facial expression, what's going on on the screen, and what kind of gestures they're trying to do on the phone. It's just very, very hard to orchestrate that. Even if you can capture all of those streams of data, it's really difficult to take notes. Because how do you take notes? User is frowning while trying to swipe, while the screen shows a certain thing. So, so these are some of the challenges we had to overcome during our, um, our studies. And I also want to bring up uh, probably this was the most important when we designing this a while ago. Um, our main goal and vision of democratizing data. That time was uh, like a great goal appear, um, timing of like a big data. There are tons of data, and then how we want to democratize and then make the analysis difficult. Fundamentally, analytics is really difficult, and then they think this is not for me. But we really wanted to make people believe in this is for you, and then you can use the analytics like a data scientist or an analyst. This is not hard. It's the mobile phone factor. So that was like our vision and goal, creating this mobile analytics. And use cases on the go, like I mentioned before, for the target audiences, um, this mobile analytics was not meant to be creating or creating dashboard or importing, da importing data or data management. It was purely data consumption. And like you see right side, this is one of the examples I wanted to touch upon more deeply. deeply um, early user research revealed actually People spend a lot of time creating the dashboard and then uh, giving a presentation to the executives or one-on-one um, -on -one meeting or business brief. So we wanted to make kind of dedicated view for the presentation view so they don't have to spend any time to download, getting screenshots, and then open the PowerPoint, like putting together and preparing the presentation. So this dedicated pre presentation mode is really uh, you have in your pocket, you just open it, and then just to show it on the um, screens or projector like this. So it's always ready to share whatever um, 
the data have on your dashboard information. And um, I want to share design principles, four of the design principles share, uh, shaped our mobile analytics. Phone first, coherence, fluidity, and simplicity. First, phone first. Um, like I keep mentioning, it start, we started with the mobile phone first because it's always, um, it makes sense because uh, we want to think about what's the most important data and information we want to show on the mobile and think about all the constraints we will have. So, and easier to go outward like tablet or desktop or even TV. And also this, is the, this was the feeling to our vision at Salesforce, run your business on your mobile phone. This is the example I wanted to share with you. Um, on the mobile phone factor, as you can see, first there's a top key metrics on the top, big numbers, but users are always um, able to see more details. The second page in the table view, they can take an action, and then when you scroll down, the breakdown in the char charts, in this case, donut charts. Information hierarchy is very important on the mobile phone factor. And same data, same information, different layout. I wanted to emphasize on how we optimize the dashboard layout and data, but for the um, tablet design. Second principle is coherence. Um, Steve just uh, mentioned, so iPhone this year is 10 years celebration, right? And there is, it is probably the dominant platform for the mobile phone factor. Android also second biggest one, but outside of the states and San Francisco probably it's, it's the biggest one. So the reason I'm mentioning this is um, when they just announced the mobile phone, probably the ratio and screen size was not that many. So design for as a designer, so a lot of designers like me started with the fixed ratio on the uh, phone, phone, individual phone size, individual phone uh, devices. But it's been already more than 10 years. There are so many devices. If you just think about Android, probably no exaggeration, like more than 100,000. So as a designer, also developers, we cannot design one by one. We need to think about how it's the experience going to be on different form factor and platform and how it's gonna scale even bigger screens. So coherence means here is um, we instead of instead of focusing on individual screens, we focus on what users would wanna achieve on their form factor, what's their main task, what they're trying to do. So this really allows us to think about um, harmonious experience on different different um, devices. So this is phone and this is iPad. We, we give them the same experience, but similar functionality, but it's um, optimized for its form factor. So they can see more detailed information by just tapping it on the chart, or context, context directions. In this case, they can change different uh, chart types, or dive into more details, or slice and dice, or those different uh, ways. And this is the screen, uh, actually users can even change the query. We wanted to think about how would even you just want to change the query, like uh, asking questions and answering those business questions on the go even on the mobile mobile phone factor. And third one is fluidity. So animation transition is so even getting more and more attention in the US industry and it's huge. It's not just about giving um, pretty pictures. In analytics, it's fundamentally hard to uh, difficult for users to understand, so we really wanted to leverage this fluidity to help them even, um, they don't have to try to hard to understand their data. So the way we did is um, we, we want to take advantage of the evoke their emotion, also delight the experience. Also, so lastly, as you can see here, it's not just uh, showing the animation per se, but this animation actually helps the users understand the data. You can scroll left and right on the legend, but that is connected with the donut chart itself. So by tapping one of those, it rotates and it's connected to the legend. So you can imme immediately see those slices, it's what those segments are on the chart. And as you can see here, each data, uh, when you change different chart type, for example, this, or change query, filtering dimensions or measures, all data, we really wanted um, connect the thread, thread of the data while they are exploring. So they always know their context, 
where they are and then how they are actually transforming visual. So this kind of visual momentum, first of all, looks really cool. So the sales teams loved it because it was very easy for them to demo to their customers. But for the end user perspective, it helped connect data to the same data even when the visualization changed. So this is a really, really key element of the design of the, uh, the analytics tools. So if you see now in the industry, a lot of people probably, a lot of uh, co companies and products provide like this. But we actually started this like four years ago. Yeah. Right? So it was pretty revolutionary that time. I'm very proud of it. This didn't exist on the phone back then. And last principle, simplicity. Um, again, this is mobile phone. So we really want to think about what's the most important data users would want to see. And we really need wanted to distill down. And also, fundamentally, analytics is diff difficult. But um, by providing the most important information on the top on their hands, let's talk i talk over one by one on this screen. Um, I'm not going to go over too much details, but what I wanted to say on this screen is uh, we wanted to so see what would users want to do on individual screens. The left most first screen is the dashboard landing page. Second one is uh, uh, users can drill tapping into individual charts and see the more details. Third one is actually opening up those widget charts. And next one is seeing the detailed data and then uh, following uh, with the contextual actions. So primary actions would be probably here, I want to scroll up and down, see data, or double tapping on the chart, or rotating the donuts, or tapping those uh, segments, and I see information. But we, 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 while providing the primary actions and then this key point, we also want to see there is, a, there is more when users want to see more data. So users can tap, shake, or double tapping, swiping, but we don't want to overwhelm users by showing all this up front. Like naturally, progressively, users naturally find it. And um, this is the last part. <laughs> uh, yeah, 10 yeah. minutes, I think uh, it's okay. Uh, then I want to talk about briefly, and then I want to close this talk with our design process. Then in Salesforce, how we innovate and create this amazing product. So start with innovation is always understanding our users' needs what their current pain point, what their experience is like. So we collaborate with research, um, researchers a lot like Steve to understand their current pain point and then having like a really deeper empathy. And do you want to talk about? Yeah, one, yeah a couple of things that we, we observed. Um, so the mobile research teams do a lot of work observationally. So th that means is in some, time, some cases we might actually bring mobile users into the office or into a lab and observe how they use the product. That gives us some of that gestural and facial information. More valuable is watching how they work in the field. And uh, especially from a sales use case, what we noticed is that salespeople, especially salespeople who do their work on their mobile device, aren't just tethered to the mobile device. They have multiple other devices. They also have paper that they use. Uh, in their car or in their vehicles. So one of the things that we learned through doing observational study was that things like findability were really critical. Uh, if, a, if a person is driving, ideally stopped, maybe on the side of the road, maybe not actually driving, it's really critical for them to be able to find the right sales metrics right before they visit with a key client. Another thing that we do is we do interviews. And through the interview uh, process, you probably know, if you've heard me talk before, uh, we know that asking users what they want isn't the best way to get information because users are just reacting to their current challenges. But we want to understand what problems are they experiencing. So through interviews and through observations, we learned things like, well, I really wish I had landscape mode so I could see this. Um, right now, uh, the product does not support landscape mode as far as I understand, right? Not on mobile, but the oh, OK, of yeah, so the, the mobile uh, is still portrait only. And when we talked about why did they need that, the ultimate goal was, I need to be able to see this number in context with these other numbers. So maybe landscape mode is absolutely the right way to go, but there might be other more elegant design solutions that also satisfy other uncovered problems um, that we would go for. The last area of, um, of needs it is coming through feedback that we'd get primarily through our various listening posts. So any kinds of instrumentation in the product or any kinds of um, surveys that come in. We basically hear the kinds of feedback uh, that people give us as they're interacting with the product, either in aggregate or individually. This is a great way for us to find um, evidence of, of bugs if, the product, if it's a shipping product or evidence of unmet needs. And um, we'll talk more about that in a moment. 
that's the first stage, and next stage is creating concepts. We have uh, this amazing culture of um, generating ideas. We collaborate with a lot of stakeholders, researchers, other PMs, even other designers. And this is the time we often call it like design thinking. There's no boundaries, constraints. Don't think about the technologies or feasibility. How it can help users to improve their um, daily tasks or make it efficient and effective? How it can help? They, can, they don't have to stay in their office and they enjoy their life more. So yeah, this is the time we draw a lot of sketches and post note time and generating ideas, like you did uh, in the workshop, like crazy ideas, they're forging in paper. Crazy eights. Yeah. And the next stage, as a designer, I think about how we can, how I am gathering all those information and then distill down and then creating flow, end-to-end -end flow, and make a wireframe. And this stage probably, not every time, but we a lot of times also talk to customers, sort of like a validate, validate, validating a concept. And next stage is code solution. This is the time we actually collaborating with the developers and productize our design. And getting um, um creating high fidelity prototype and also get usability tests out of it. Last stage is releasing product. We have a uh, three release product in Salesforce per year, three release per year. But mobile is not necessarily following this release cycle because um, we need to submit to stores, Apple to Apple App Store or Google Play, Google Play, and we have a feedback channel we are still getting from users. There is a section feedback and users keep continuously giving us feedback, what's right, what's wrong, and what's not working, and how we, want, how we need to, how they want us to improve their experience. And the reason also we are releasing more than three times a year is like, um, there's a platform we are supporting besides Salesforce, like um, iOS platform, Android, or Windows, and they always have every year new, new OS, and then we, want, we need to keep up with it and make it work perfect on both platforms. And also tons of other bugs. So there's a bug test to this too. Not tons. Not tons of bugs. Just some bugs. Uh, that's minor <laughs> bugs. But, yeah. You want to make it. That's true. Yeah. So I would say probably if I say the top size is three releases per year, we probably mobile probably once every other month or even open than that. So yeah, this is the feedback channel. Of, I don't know if. I can, yeah, I just mentioned we have a three-phased feedback uh, channel process. We have listening posts embedded in the product, so analytics usage data shows up so that we can understand what users are using in aggregate. Uh, it also lets us know what features are being adopted and the velocity of that adoption, as well as uh, what features aren't being used, which allows us to do qualitative research to understand why is this feature not being used. Maybe it's not needed, or maybe it's not discoverable, or maybe it's not usable. Um, and then the last uh, listening posts are as a user interacts with the product, the product is the thing that most of us don't find super exciting. It says, how do you like it? And if they say, oh, I like it, we'll say, oh, would you please consider writing us a review? Um, and also giving feedback. If they say, I don't like it, we'll like, we say, we really want to hear your, hear your feedback. And we have an embedded um, feedback survey in the product. There's also a feedback survey that people can use at any time. And when they click that, it provides us the ability to identify, first of all, whether or not there might be a bug or a defect every time iOS or um, Android changes their platform, maybe that broke something. So we get uh, early warnings about that. And then second of all, we hear the wish list items. Customers say, I really wish I could do X. That gives the research team a great opportunity to do additional research and the design team opportunities to start ideating and, and um, creating new concepts. So this is the brief of our design process. And as you guys know, obviously, Every step is very iterative, and there's no, like, it's not a linear process. So takeaways, we talked about briefly user-centered design, and four design principles, use cases, target audiences. And but wait, there's more. There's more. <laughs> I want you guys to download that experience. We have on um, Apple App Store, Google Play Store, and if you guys download it, there is a we call sample data, so you guys don't have to purchase the Salesforce license. You can just play with it. Yeah, there's sample data sets that you can use. You can use it on your device right now. Um, I'd recommend please don't fill out the feedback survey unless you find a real problem uh, or you just want to say hi. All feedback goes directly to me as well as the, uh, the mobile analytics team. I guess that's it. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you.